On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, there's a new ship in the U.S. Merchant Marine, and it carries a lot of gas. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. That's right, we have a new ship in the U.S. Merchant Marine, and it is a liquefied natural gas carrier. Big news, we haven't had one in the fleet for a long time, and now Crowley Maritime has entered a new ship, the American Energy, into the fleet. We're going to discuss that and what it means going forward. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell to be alerted about new videos as they come out. If you want to learn more about this type of transport, I'm going to recommend you over to another YouTube channel, Offshore Maritime and Energy. It's a small channel. It's only got about 2,500 subscribers, but they have great videos on all different types of offshore oil and gas carriers including this, a history of the first intercontinental LNG carrier, the Methane Pioneer, which was a U.S. flag vessel. Yes, the U.S. has been involved in the transportation of liquefied natural gas for a long time. So Crowley is launching this in partnership with Netergy, uh, and this new service will be providing regular service to Puerto Rico. Now, the American Energy is a 1994 French-built LNG that's coming in under a special provision, which we'll talk about here in a second. They acquired the vessel Crowley in December of 2024 from a subsidiary of Malaysia's MISC Burhad. Uh, the vessel was placed in registry as the American Energy in January of 2025. She had previously been known as the ITAN, registered in Liberia. She is 900 feet long, can carry 130,400 cubic meters or 34.4 million gallons of liquefied natural gas. She's going to operate under, in accordance with the U.S. Coast Guard Authorization Act of 1996 and be on a dedicated service from the United States Gulf Coast to Puerto Rico. So before we talk about the registry, let's talk about crews. One of the things that Crowley needed were mariners to crew this vessel. And to do that, they went to two unions. They went to AMO, the American Maritime Officers Union, to get the deck and engineers necessary. Now, remember, you just don't need one crew set for this. You need two. You need one who's going to be on the ship and the other coming on board to relieve them. So you have to double up your captains and chief mates and chief engineers. And then also you need unlicensed. And there they went to the SIU, the Seafarers International Union, to get the unlicensed personnel, the stewards, the cooks, the wipers, the ABs, the able-bodied seamen, all the crew necessary for this. And obviously it took time to train them up on a liquefied natural gas carrier. All right, the big sticking point here is registry. How is it that they're able to operate a foreign-built, French-built liquefied natural gas carrier in the closed cabotage trade that is known as the Jones Act? Well, there's a provision in a Coast Guard authorization that allowed them to do that. So like anything, you just have to find your provision within law to do it. Now, the ship is not operating under a Jones Act waiver. In other words, there wasn't a special dispensation giving to Crowley so they can bring the ship in. They went back to public law 104-324. This is the Coast Guard Authorization Act for 1996. So on page 78 of this law, section 1120, documentation of certain vessels, subsection F, certificate of documentation for liquefied gas tanker, notwithstanding section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. Yes, that is the cabotage section. That is the section that says that you have to be U.S. flagged, U.S. owned, U.S. built, and U.S. owned. They get that exempted because of this. It goes on here, section 12106 of Title 46, U.S. Code, section 506 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1936. In any agreement with the U.S. government, the Secretary of Transportation may issue a certificate of documentation with a coastwise endorsement for a vessel to transport liquefied natural gas or liquefied petroleum gas to the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico from other ports in the United States if the vessel is one foreign built vessel that was built prior to the date of enactment of this act. Two is documented under chapter 121 of Title 46 U.S. Code before the date of enactment of this act, even if the vessel is placed under a foreign registry and subsequently redocumented under that chapter for operation under this section. So that's a mouthful, but suffice it to say that under the law, they are perfectly legal to bring this ship in and operate it. Now, I have been advocating this for a long time. 
This is a video I did back in January of 2022. I mean, just a little bit after this, the channel was up and running, where I talked about the fact of using, bringing in liquefied natural gas tankers into the registry uh, to provide service to, at the time I was talking about New England. Now, you will not be able to service New England with this, with this specific tanker. This one has got to operate solely in the Puerto Rico service. However, I've been advocating to bring ships into the U.S. registry. It's going to take at least minimum five years to build a liquefied natural gas carrier in the United States. What should be done is to bring ships outside from being built in the United States, reflag them in with the provision that whatever ships are brought into the registry, the company that's operating them gets a contract to build a liquefied natural gas carrier in the United States. And we, the United States, should be providing some incentives to do that, including low interest loans, uh, defrayed uh, costs on interest until the ship is built and in the trade. There's a lot of things we can do. We can do investments, bonds for the vessels, just a variety of issues that can be done. Let's take a look at the statement here from Crowley. They go in here that the Crowley owned American carrier, American Energy, capacity of 130,000 cubic meters. The vessel has a cap one rating certifying its top rating for safety and vessel condition. It goes on, this is from Puerto Rico Governor Jennifer Gonzalez Colon. The entry in the service of American Energy marks a significant step for fuel supply reliability in Puerto Rico for our energy grid, which will greatly benefit our people. She goes on to say, this partnership is an initiative to act using existing regulations to increase access to the US-based LNG source that expands our options for the stabilization of our energy grid as we work towards providing our residents and businesses a more consistently reliable generation source. It goes on that the company also operates fuel service um, Marine Isla Grande cargo terminal in San Juan for its container and roll-on roll-off facilities, including two LNG-fueled ships. Crowley annually delivers more than 94 million gallons of LNG through its loading terminal in Pinalelas, as well as provide ocean delivery and land transportation using ISO containers. Here's marine traffic showing the American energy. Uh, the ship loaded in Corpus Christi and is set sail for Puerto Rico. She'll discharge at the Eco Electrica on the south side of the island. The vessel will run a dedicated loop with approximately every two weeks between the U.S. Gulf and Puerto Rico. Each load can power 80,000 homes per year. If you do 26 trips a year, that's going to be 2 million homes per year. Natergy, who Crowley is teamed up with, sells the gas primarily to Eco Electrica and Costa Sur power plants. A portion of the gas is transported exclusively by Crowley via ISO containers. These are modular containers that have been used to transport natural gas to the island in the past and to industrial and commercial customers on the island who have installed on site microgrids to power their facilities. So this chart from the Department of Energy, uh, this is as of December of 2024, this is the latest information we have, shows you the imports into Puerto Rico of LNG and the vast majority of LNG that goes into Puerto Rico comes from Trinidad and Tobago. And you're probably going to see quite a bit of LNG still come into Puerto Rico from Trinidad and Tobago, mainly because of the distance. It is much shorter to Trinidad, Tobago to Puerto Rico, then from the Gulf Coast to Puerto Rico. But the key here is to really get rid of those exports from other regions, from Nigeria, Norway, Egypt, and Spain. So you're going to see a lot of this being taken up by the American energy. Now, I should note, critics of American LNG carriers will not shut up because the American energy has been reflagged in. I am talking to you, Cato, and all the other ones who are going to scream about this. They have argued for a long time to bring in American LNG to get a U.S. LNG carrier and more importantly, to get American LNG from the Gulf Coast of the United States to Puerto Rico. And now that is being done. Obviously, one of the big issues is going to be the age of this vessel. The fact that you're using a 30 year old vessel to do it is not great. We really need to be using more of a state of the art vessel, a more efficient vessel. And my argument here is let's go ahead in a next authorization, authorize that to bring in a newer vessel. However, with all the attention on U.S. shipbuilding, we should be talking about building liquefied natural gas carriers in the United States. We just saw China sign a 15-year deal with Australia 
to get liquefied natural gas at the expense of the United States. We need to have our own liquefied natural gas carriers out there hauling our liquefied natural gas so that we can be a big player out there and go to places other than China and sell our liquefied natural gas. But more importantly, you're going to have an American ship hauling it. However, you are going to experience some issues. The higher wages associated with an American mariner. Understand the minimum wage for a foreign mariner at sea is $666 a month. It's $22 a day. $22 a day. That's going to be hard to compete with with American wages, no matter what you do. So it's going to be more expensive to haul on a U.S. ship. And I guarantee you that's going to be the new screaming that we're going to hear come from the Anti-Jones Act uh, group. First, they're going to scream about U.S. shipbuilding. Well, you got a non-U.S. built ship into the fleet. Now you're going to hear the screams about U.S. crews. That is the next thing you'll hear. And again, we should be offsetting that cost. We should be basically allowing merchant mariners operating in international trade, for example, to operate without federal income tax. That's what a lot of countries do. That's how they lower the cost for their mariners. They make it more inducive for mariners to go to sea, to go after that life, to, to pursue that life, to choose that career. We don't do that. We should be incentivizing companies like Crowley and others that are going to go into this trade to get more involved in this. Crowley is opening the door for the United States to get into LNG trade, and we should be following along with them. I think this is a great opportunity we're seeing, and we just need to capitalize on it. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell to be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can buy a newer liquefied natural gas carrier and bring it into the U.S. registry. Or if you don't have that amount of cash on hand, hey, hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next episode, this is Sal signing off. <coughs> Sorry, a little gas.